time has finally come to review uh, Cerberus' uh, overall system architecture. So far, we've been looking only at this, or mostly uh, at this part, which is the circuit for video generation with two custom chips, Kavia and Skunk. I am officially calling it now Skunk in in instead of Skank. <laughs> and that's for obvious reasons. The, 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 the word Skank doesn't sound very nice uh, uh, in American English. So it's now Skunk. Uh, for, uh, what does it stand for again? Scanning, counter and clock. And you can pick these letters uh, from those three words to form the word uh, skank, skunk. <laughs> and now they are two cute little mammals as well, a skunk and a cavia or a guinea pig. Uh, so these you've seen together with the oscillator. You've seen this as well, uh, the two dual ported memories uh, uh, that are being used for video memory here on top and here below the character definition uh, memory. So all this you've already seen. Now it's time to reveal what you haven't seen yet. We are going to connect other system components to the control, address, and data buses. <clears throat> now, the first thing we will do is instead of using uh, the older, for instance, the 6522, the older chips to do uh, serial I.O. or serial input output, we are going to go for a modern alternative, an uh, AT-MEGA328P, which is the microcontroller used in the Arduino Uno uh, boards. We are going to use a 16 megahertz oscillator to drive the AT-MEGA. Now notice, I'm not going to use an Arduino board, I'm going to use the AT-MEGA controller, uh, which is packaged, uh, I believe, in a 20, 28-pin uh, DIP package. It's a tiny little microcontroller. Uh, I would use that directly, not, uh, not an Arduino. Now, the thing is, uh, it has very few uh, I.O. pins. This little thing here is not like a CPU, which can put uh, 16 uh, uh, bits on the address bus together with 8 bits on the data bus and another handful, 6 bits uh, on the control bus, all in parallel, all at the same time. This thing has 28 pins for everything. <laughs> so there are no parallel buses. This is not a CPU. It is a small RISC processor. RISC stands for Reduced Instruction Set Computer, as opposed to the older CPUs, which are CISC or Complex Instruction Set uh, Computers. RISC processors uh, can run faster, but they do very little uh, at each uh, instruction cycle. The instructions are very simple. And again, they don't have parallel buses buses so this is not a cpu this will just be our io controller because it's very good at um, serial communications it has all the protocols already built in but it also has to talk to the buses and how does a serial io controller talk to parallel buses well we are going to add a third and final custom chip to cerberus called spacer for serial to parallel controller and what it would do, it would take, amongst other things, the serial bits here going in and out of the Atmega and translating them into parallel words that are put together on the different buses uh, of the architecture for input and output as well. Now, in addition to the I.O. controller and spacer, of course, we need some system memory and we are going to use two 32 kilobyte SRAM chips for that. Out of which, in the second chip, we are only going to use 28 kilobytes because the memory map is such that we need four kilobytes for the dual ported uh, video and character memories. So we can't address the second 32 kilobyte block fully. We will not have address space for that, but it doesn't matter. It's too much cheaper and more efficient to use a 32 kilobyte chip here next to this one which will be fully used so the system will have in total 64 kilobytes of addressable ram and there will be no rom why because the atmega already has an onboard sram an onboard eprom so what we are going to do the atmega will fetch uh, the kernel code and the basic interpreter code at startup and we will just load it into the lower address spaces of this block of 64 kilobytes as RAM. 
and that will happen seamlessly during startup. So we don't need any prom, which has the added benefit that not only we are using all the resources in the Atmega, uh, we also can dynamically change the kernel code and the computer will be running. Some smart programmers could possibly make use uh, of that ability to change the kernel code dynamically while the application is executing. Now, the final thing we need, of course, is a CPU. One, or maybe even better, two CPUs, a Z80 and a 6502, or its modern version, the W65CO2S from the Western Design Center. Now, Cerberus will not run both CPUs at the same time. Uh, it will run the Atmega processor together with one of the CPUs and uh, the user will be able to configure and say, okay, I want to run on the Z80 now or I want to run on the 6502, but it's one of the two at a time, not both together. The one that has not been selected will be powered down uh, by the Atmega microcontroller, at least that's what I'm thinking right now. Uh, but since, you know, the rest of the architecture here is so flexible, it can do so many things, it would seem to me like a pity to put just a Z80 in there and shut the 6502 assembly programmers uh, out of the party. So we are going to put both in there and people can have fun with either one of them or both, uh, w whichever way uh, they want. Now notice that uh, the Z80 is a true CPU, the 6502 is a true CPU, and although the Atmega is not a CPU, it's a much simpler serial uh, uh, controller, it does have a processor inside. So if we count in terms of processors, then this is a three processor architecture. It has three processors and that's why I'm calling it Cerberus. Let me clear that those lines in there. I'm calling it Cerberus, the, the mythical three-headed dog that guarded the entrance of Hades, I think, the underworld in, in, in Greek mythology. So that's why it's Cerberus. And the 2080 is a reference to a combination of the PET 2001, that's the 2000, and the ZX80, uh, and the, uh, uh, the TRS-80. So to honor all of those computers from the late 70s or very, very early 80s, I'm calling it Cerberus 2080 because uh, this architecture can emulate, well, can emulate, it hopefully will be, depending on how well I do with uh, changing the kernel code, hopefully it will be outright backward compatible with at least one or two of these three machines uh, that I just mentioned. Uh, the next thing is we will feed the clock signal also directly into Spacer. And the reason is Spacer will also do the clock management for the CPUs. So in addition to doing serial to parallel translation, in addition to doing uh, the memory management functionality, which I will talk about uh, soon, it will also do the clock uh, management and the power management of the two CPUs. So the CPU clock will come from Spacer, derived from the original oscillator here. It will come from Spacer and go into the two CPUs. And there will also be uh, some signals connected to an analog power management circuit that will allow uh, the user to choose one of the CPUs and then the system will automatically power down the CPU that has not uh, been chosen to prevent you know, unnecessary static power dissipation and, and having to add more tri-state buffers. So we just power down the CPU that's not being used. At least that's what I'm thinking right now. Now, the next uh, thing to, to get into is, okay, how are we going to use this little microcontroller here? There are only 28 pins. How we are going to budget our use of these pins? Here's what we are going to do. There are seven pins on the Atmega 328P that uh, we cannot use anyway for uh, general purpose digital I.O. Uh, these are these four pins here and these three. Uh, three of them are ground, two of them are VCC, and two of them are dedicated crystal uh, pins. That's for the crystal oscillator. Uh, one of them I'm not going to use because I'm not going to uh, attach a crystal here. I'm going to use a, a full-blown oscillator. But even without using one of them, I have to leave it floating. I cannot use that pin for other purposes. So instead of 28, we actually have only 21 pins. Or do we? Because there are other three pins here, 
pins 1, 2, and 3, which, although they can be used for general purpose uh, digital I.O., I don't want to use them for that, because one of them uh, is the reset pin, and I want a, a overall reset for Cerberus, so I want to use that pin for a reset, and then two of them are for serial communication, uh, meant to reprogram uh, the uh, AT Mega 328, and that's what would allow me to, or allow you or whoever is going to use Cerberus, uh, to reprogram the microcontroller while it is sitting in the system without having to remove the chip from the board and put it in a programmer. So I want to keep these two pins here, pins uh, 2 and 3, reserved for their uh, uh, first purpose, which is serial programming of the microcontroller. So that leaves us with, well, 18 uh, pins <laughs> instead of 28, and only to address uh, um, the, the address bus and the data bus, we need 24, even if we could use all the remaining pins of the Atmega for that, uh, that wouldn't do, and, and, and if we did that, <laughs> there would be no extra pins for all the I.O. So here's what I'm planning to do. I'm going to, uh, let me clear out some of this, I'm going to use six of the pins, these six here, uh, the specific pin out I may change later on, but th that gives you an idea of the budget, six of the pins will be uh, for talking to Spacer, Spacer will be uh, an ATF 1508 uh, CPLD. And the idea is that through these pins, we can convey the serial data and the control uh, signals necessary for translating the serial data into something parallel that, uh, that uh, Spacer can do. So the serial data pins are this one here, these two serial inputs and serial output. So as the name implies, serial input uh, will get uh, uh, data from Spacer that was originally parallel data from the data bus. Spacer will serialize it and it will go into the microcontroller through this pin, SI. And serial output is the same thing the other way around. Serial data goes out of the microcontroller and into Spacer, which will then organize it in a parallel manner and put that data on the data bus together with a parallel address. Now, the other uh, four signals here are for controlling the shift register. There will be a large shift register here uh, in, in Spacer. And we need to control that shift register uh, with four control signals. Uh, one is the shift register clock. So when you put a bit into the shift register, you have to clock it for every bit of serial data you want to, to shift into it. This will be the shift register output enable. We want to enable the output only when the shift register is full with uh, the address and the data. If we enable the output before that, we will be putting noise on the address bus and on the data bus. So we need uh, this uh, output enable. This is a left-right pin, which will tell the shift register whether it should shift to the left or to the right. Both will be needed, depending on circumstances. And this is the shift register latch. And this control signal is used when the shift register already has an address being uh, exposed to the address bus, but we want to latch the data that will then become available on the data bus. We want to do a parallel load of a byte of data into the shift register, so we can then shift it out into the serial in port of the microcontroller. So for the price of six signals, two for data, in and out, and four for control, uh, we, we can uh, allow for parallel communication to the tune of 24 parallel bits, 16 for address and eight for data. So this is a good trade-off, six pins playing the role of 24. It's not bad. Now, there will be other two signals sent to Spacer. This is the CPU choice signal. Uh, it will make a choice between the Z80 or the 60, uh, 6502. And this is the clock speed uh, pin. And the idea is uh, I want to be able to let the user of Cerberus choose whether the clock speed will be fast or slow for that given uh, CPU. 
I might ask, well, why don't you just run it at the fastest clock speed you can? Well, the reason is, uh, take the ZX80 or the ZX81, for instance. Cerberus, even if we would run the Z80 at the same original speed of 3.5 MHz, Cerberus would already be a lot faster than the ZX, ZX81, because in the case of the ZX81, the CPU was occupied three quarters of the time with printing the screen, and in the case of Cerberus, that task is taken over by uh, uh, Skunk and, and, and Caviar. So that will already make the thing at least four times faster. And then if you run the Z80 at 8 MHz, uh, then it will become so fast that some of the games, some of the old software, may become unplayable. You may not have enough reaction time to do anything. So I want to preserve the option of running the Z80 at 2 uh, MHz uh, and running the 6502 at 1 megahertz of course the 6502 is not a slower processor it, it operates under a slower clock speed but it does a lot more per clock cycle than the z80 so we cannot compare uh, 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 those two the performance of those two in terms of clock speed alone which a lot of people online seem to do that's that's naive uh, 6502 would do a memory access in one cycle while the z80 will take three cycles for instance and this is just one of the differences so slow clock speed speed for the Z80 is 2 MHz, for the 6502 is 1 MHz, and the fast clock speed for both will be 8 MHz, which is half the 16 MHz at which the Atmega itself uh, will be running. So we need two bits to make the choice, and we pass them on to Spacer, which will then orchestrate the clock management logic and the power logic uh, accordingly. Now, after we've done this, we've ensured that uh, the microcontroller can connect to the main buses of the system, write to memory, read from memory, communicate with the CPUs, but it's an I.O. controller. So what is still missing is the main job of this thing, which is to do the I.O. So we are going to take two bits uh, for interfacing with a PS2 keyboard, a PS2 uh, uh, plug has uh, four pins, one is ground, another one is VCC, and then the active pins are clock and data. So when you press a key on a PS2 keyboard, uh, you get these two signals, clock and data, and the Atmega uh, needs to be able to interpret them uh, to see what, what key you pressed. And this is done via uh, an interrupt schema uh, in the Atmega, so the Atmega doesn't need to keep on polling the keyboard continuously. Whenever you press a key, there will be an interrupt issue, then the Atmega will just go there and, and, and read the key. So this is an ideal I.O. controller, which was not available back in the day, uh, but today uh, it would just not be reasonable to not use uh, uh, an Atmega for, for that. Now, in addition to the keyboard, we want to produce some sound as an output. Uh, so I plan to use a little piezo uh, a buzzer or a piezo beeper. Um, and we need one digital signal, uh, which will contain a square wave of a programmable frequency that we can choose uh, to produce the sound. And then uh, uh, the plan is to use an SD card as a kind of hard disk drive for the system, where we restore all the files and store programs we write and so forth. Um, and we need four signals for that, four pins. One is the master input slave output. So that's when the SD card is sending data to the Atmega, which is the master. Then a master output slave input. That's when the Atmega is writing something to the card. And then, of course, uh, we need a, a serial clock and a chip select uh, as well. And finally, as you just saw for a brief moment, uh, the other three signals we'll be using to interface directly to the control bus. So when it comes to the control bus, it's not going through Spacer. Uh, there are only three signals uh, that we absolutely need. More would be nice, but three we absolutely need. And we have the pins on the Atmega to interface directly to the control bus. Uh, one of the signals is the non-maskable interrupt. So when the Atmega has ensured that there is a program in instruction memory and everything is set up, the CPU can start and execute it. Uh, it can then issue a non-maskable interrupt to the CPU and get the CPU to kick into action, so to say. Now, the other way around, the CPU can issue an I.O. request, uh, which basically asks the Atmega for some uh, uh, input data from a certain input port or an I.O. port. 
So that's the signal that comes the other way around into the microcontroller. And the microcontroller, uh, when it's talking to space or putting an address and data on the, on the, on the buses, it needs to tell uh, the rest of the system, not only spacer, whether it's trying to read or write. That's why this read-write signal here, this bit, goes straight into, into the control bus from which spacer can read it. But it doesn't go to spacer because it's not exclusive to spacer. Uh, everybody needs to see that. The memories need to see what you're trying to read or write to them and so on. So as you see, uh, it's just right. <laughs> the 28 pins of the little microcontroller are just enough for us to do everything. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Now, what I want to, to go into more details with you is the logic that will operate on the six uh, signals here. The two serial data pins and the four control pins. I want to share with you exactly how that will be done. Just to give you an idea, uh, uh, SI stands for serial in, as I just mentioned. This is serial out, the shift register clock, the shift register output enable, the left right signal and the shift register latch. Uh, let's get into the details of how these signals uh, are used. Now, uh, this is much simpler in a hardware description language, but uh, some of you may not be used to that. So I just wanted to show you the circuit in a simplified version so you get some intuition for what's happening. We will have a shift register with 24 flip-flops, 16 for address, 8 for data. So there will be 24 of these little flip-flops here. I'm only showing three. I'm showing only the very first one and then two, but there would then be uh, several others here building up to 24 flip-flops connected in exactly the same way that I'm showing here. Now, the input of the flip-flop is D, that's what you see here, that's the D input, that's the clock. So when the clock ticks in a rising edge, then this value from the input D will go into the output Q. That's how the flip-flop flip -flop works. On the rising edge, well, whatever is in D goes to Q and then it's held in Q. It's a little memory element. Q will remember what the value was that you latched into uh, the flip-flop. Okay, so now what about this This here? What What is going on here? That's the logic for deciding what the flip-flop should latch. Now, uh, this is the serial output of Atmega. So Atmega may be putting out 24 bits on its serial output pin that will correspond to a full address of 16 bits and a full data of 8 bits. So that's 24 bits, but it needs to shift this this information bit by bit from right to left. So on the very first flip-flop, one of the inputs is the serial output of the Atmega. And that output will be latched into D here when the uh, shift register latch signal is negative. In other words, we are not trying to latch anything from a pin. Uh, we are just shifting things into the shift register. And when the left to right is high, which means we are shifting left and not right. So under these two conditions here, the SO will be latched into Q upon a tick of the shift register clock, which also comes from the microcontroller. So the microcontroller has the freedom to do all this, to control all this. Now, uh, what is the other alternative when you're shifting data? Well, the other alternative is that you may be wanting to shift to the right and you are still not trying to latch anything. So uh, shift right to the latch is still negative, just as it was here. So this uh, uh, will not be active. And that means that uh, this whole thing here will not be active because if you end anything with a negative signal, it's zero, the output. Um, and this will not be active either, because now, by hypothesis, LR is zero. So now we will be shifting to the right. Why? Because the input D is now wired to the output Q of the flip-flop to the left. So when SC, shift register clock, takes the value that was here, will now be here. In other words, it will 
shift to the right. And because this is uh, uh, the, the same circuit applies to every state, this will also do the same. It, it will be shifted from D to Q. So the value of Q here will go to Q there. It will shift right and so on and so forth and so forth. Now the same thing happens when we were talking about things going to the left. Each state will just be latched into the flip-flop immediately to the left. That's how you shift an entire address and an, an entire byte of data into the shift register. However, sometimes you're not trying to shift anything in on or out. Sometimes you just want to capture whatever is on the I.O. pins of Spacer. These are pins of Spacer connected to the address and data bus. So sometimes you, you need to, to latch whatever is on the data bus. You want to do a data read. Now, in these cases, this signal here, the shift register latch, will be high. And therefore, this will not be active because you're taking the, the inversion. Uh, this will be zero, so this will, these two ends will not be active because this signal here, uh, since it's the inverse of shift, shift register latch, it will be zero. If you end anything with zero, it's zero. So this value of the pin will go into D and will be latched upon a tick, a rising edge of the shift register clock. And that's why the serial input of the atmega will be hanging from the Q output of the very first flip-flop in the chain. Because when you activate SRL, everything on the pins will be latched into the respective flip-flops. Everything, all the way, 24 bits. And after you've done that, now you can shift right again through the serial input of the Atmega. And then the Atmega can find out what, what was captured through the entire data bus uh, um, and even the address bus, although that's not going to be used. But uh, the Atmega can know everything that, uh, that was on the buses at that point. Because after you latch it, you can deactivate this and then you just shift everything to the right. So this is how it works. We will have 24 uh, of these flip-flops in the shift register. Uh, uh, the 16 most significant ones uh, will be the 16 address bits from A15 to A0. And then we start with the data bits D7 to D0. And the reason this is done this way is that most of the times when you want to read what was on the bus, you want to read the data bus. So you put the data bits first, so you only need to shift right eight times. And you ignore whatever was shifted right here on the address uh, part. You only shift right eight times and you know what byte uh, was uh, on the data bus. Now, notice that uh, in a hardware description language, it's a lot easier to make sense of all this that I've just explained to you. And although beginners in, in digital design tend to prefer schematics like this, like what I just showed, um, very soon you will find out that except for the simplest little digital projects, schematics go out of hand very quickly. It's very hard to deal with complexity in a schematic. In a hardware description language, it's much easier to specify uh, what's going on and to understand what's going on. You, you, you get a much better overview of everything that's happening. You can keep much better control and can manage it uh, much better. So we are going to look at that. But before we do that, let's have a quick look at uh, the memory map of Cerberus because we will need that <clears throat> to understand the memory management uh, uh, logic that we will find inside Cerberus. Cerberus doesn't do only this. It also does the memory management, the clock speed management, the clock management, the, 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 the power management of the CPUs. So what about the memory management? Well, to understand that, we need to get to the memory mapping. And uh, this is how it looks like. We will get uh, the first uh, 32 kilobytes uh, we will allocate that to the first SRAM chip. And it, that will be addresses, uh, you know, this address here all the way to this address there. So whenever we, we have an address that falls within this range, we will enable the first SRAM chip. The chip enable for that SRAM chip will go low and it's active low. So that chip will be enabled and it's that chip that will receive the address. Now, 
And this is the last address that belongs to this SRAM chip 1. The address immediately after that already belongs to the next SRAM chip, SRAM chip 2, uh, which only has 28 kilobytes addressable, even, even though physically it will have 32 kilobytes. So the addresses that will correspond to chip 2 of the SRAM will be from this to this. Anything will, will, within this range, and it's a 28 kilobytes range, if you do the math here, uh, will, will correspond to an address to that SRAM chip, and the chip enable of that second chip will then be low or active whenever uh, an address falls within uh, this, this range here. An address on the address bus falls within this range. Now, after that, and this is the last address of the second SRAM, uh, SRAM chip, so after that, we will have two kilobytes <clears throat> that will correspond to the video RAM. So whenever there is an address on the address bus between these two values here, the chip enable of that dual ported uh, RAM uh, will go low or active and the address will go to that chip. And then again, that's the boundary and the final two kilobytes will correspond to the character dual ported RAM. So anytime that there is an address on the address bus between these two values, the chip enable of the character dual ported memory will go low or active and the, the address will correspond to, to, <clears throat> to contents of that memory. So this is the extremely simple address map of servers. And you might be wondering, well, what about the kernel? What about the code memory, the ROMs? Well, the ROM is virtual. It will just occupy a space here, some addresses, of the first SRAM chip, the initial addresses. Now, how many of them? Well, it depends on how large the kernel will be. We are not bound to any specific value here. So if the kernel is pretty small, and I'm planning to just put uh, the basic interpreter uh, there, because the actual kernel code or the BIOS will be handled by the IO chip, will be handled by the Atmega. That's another advantage of using a processor as IO controller, because that processor can be the system master, so it can do all the kernel functions which can be programmed easily in C uh, for the Atmega. So this will basically consist of the basic interpreter. I'm saying kernel memory here because well, you can use it as kernel memory as well, but it will mostly be the basic interpreter. And whenever the interpreter ends, uh, that's already usable space for data, because we are not moving to another chip. There is no ROM. <laughs> the ROM is virtual. Another advantage of not having an actual physical ROM there. You use the address space much more efficiently. Okay, so now what is the memory <coughs> mem management logic that we need in Spacer uh, to implement this address mapping? Well, it's pretty simple. MMU stands for Memory Management Unit. The MMU in this case is just a subset of Spacer. It's not a separate chip. It's all consolidated within Spacer. So the chip enable for the SRAM 1 will be the opposite of A15. Because you see, whenever A15 is zero, uh, we are talking about the first chip. But of course, the chip enable is active low, so it will actually, actually be only A15, not, not the inverse of A15, but uh, um, it's much easier for me to communicate if I pretend that it's active high, because then we can talk about when it's active, when it's enabled. So forget for a moment that this is an active low signal, pretend it's active high, so the chip enable for chip uh, SRAM chip 1 will just be the inverse of A15, which what, what you can see here. Now, what about the next SRAM chip? It's a little bit more complicated, but the logic is exactly the same. You see, these 12 bits here are all over the place within this range. They vary from all zeros to all ones. But these four bits here can be used to determine the chip enable logic for uh, the SRAM chip 2. And this is the logic. A15 should be always 1, because you see it's 1 in the beginning, and it's 1 in the end as well. It's always 1. Now, what about the other chips? If you end them together, if they are all 1s, then that's exactly what you don't want, because when they are all 1s, we are already in the higher addresses, you see, in the higher addresses. Uh, S14 to S12, they are all 1s. So we want the opposite of that. 
when they are not all ones, then we will fall within this range. See? It's quite simple. You just need to look at the bits, look at the numbers, and the logic is derived in a very straightforward way. So what about the next? What about the video RAM? Very simple too. Uh, uh, you just need to look at these five bits. The most significant five bits here. And they are always the same. The other bits, they change. They are all over the place. But these five here are always the same. And what are they? Well, one, 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 zero. That's where they are. See, one, 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 zero. That's the logic. If you implement this logic for the chip enable of the video dual ported RAM, that's all you need. And the same thing for the next one, except that now these five most significant bits are always one. So whenever Spacer sees on the address bus an address that has these first chips, the first bits here, the most significant five uh, bits, as one, all of them, then it will activate the chip enable for the character dual ported memory. That's it. It's pretty simple. Yes, a lot of information in this episode, a lot of theory. Um, this, this is necessary if I want you to follow what's going to happen in the next episode. But next time around, it will be a lot more practical, a lot less theoretical, a lot more hands-on, a lot more exciting. So stick around and I'll see you next time for episode 10 of the Cerberus uh, Saga. <laughs>